The Ogre Kingdoms The Ogre race as a whole are a completely superstitious and illiterate group, and thus there are very little to no recorded accounts of history within their race. What little information about their history remains can only be deciphered from ancient cave paintings or the oral stories passed down their culture from generation to generation. Though many of these accounts are extremely exaggerated and overly fantasized, there may yet be truth within the story that none would dare to believe. Where exactly the ogres come from and how they fit in with the other races of the world is a question many scholars have asked. Of course, such questions never occur to the ogres themselves, for they are not scholarly in the least, being unable to read or write. Ogres do value legends, often exaggerated tales of bravado told around campfires, and they do record major events with their cave drawings, but to an ogre, history means their last meal and ancient history is the feast before that. They are far more concerned with obtaining the next dinner than with debating how or why they came to be. Elven lore masters believe that the Old Ones, the mysterious beings who shaped so many of the creatures that walked the world, made the Ogres to join the fight against the rising powers of Chaos. However, the Elves theorised that quite a bit was left unfinished with the race when the Polar Gates collapsed, ushering in a tide of Chaos powers to the world. To the Elves, this explains the crude and intolerable vulgar nature of the Ogres, and hence the graceful rulers of Ulthwan generally disdain them as a lowly and dim-witted race. Human scholars led by the strangely prophetic imperial philosopher Albrecht of Nonn believe that ogres are close kindred to the race of halflings, perhaps coming from some common stock, but somewhere in time splitting into two divergent species, perhaps through some foul mutation. There are many similarities. Both races are resistant to the effects of chaos. Both have a comparable and all-consuming need to search out their next meal, and both bear unusual behavioural traits, for ogres the need to smash and eat everything, for halflings the compulsion to swipe anything not nailed down. For many thousands of years the ogres lived far to the east, in an area of great sweeping steppes. On the borders of Far Cathay was a fertile grassland that spread endlessly across the horizon, and there the ogres thrived and multiplied. They lived in tribes that followed the plentiful grazing herds of new beasts and lumbering yak that roamed the open country, providing an ever-replenishing supply of fresh meat and milk. It is said that the ogres learned the secret of fire and basic metalworking from their neighbours in Cathay, and there were no conflicts along their shared border for many generations. With no natural barriers to divide their kingdoms, they lived a nomadic existence, trading almost as much as fighting. Soon the Cathayans began to recruit the most intelligent of the ogres and indoctrinated them into the Grand Imperial Army. Yet as more and more tribes stalked the steppes for food, it was only a matter of time before ogre raids entered into Cathay and some ogres have already begun to prey upon their neighbours. Before long, the simple peasant children working in the rice fields began to go missing and the ogre race began to take the liking of Cathayan flesh. With the peaceable relations eroding away, the Celestial Dragon Emperor, his most excellent majesty Zhen Huang of the Imperial Empire of Cathay, had finally had enough of the ogres. Whether Zhen Huang's coven of ancient astronomers had anything to do with the catastrophe that befell the ogres remains speculation. Not long after bones began to litter the paddy fields that a great burning light appeared in the sky. It increased in brightness and size with every passing day until it eclipsed even the great spheres of Morsleib and Mansleib. Over the weeks, it grew to be a baleful, glowering orb that crackled and spat above the plains, turning night into day and driving the wildlife of the steppes mad with fear. A corona of sickly green light came into focus around the comet as it grew ever closer, and fanciful observers even claimed that this new celestial body had a face or more accurately, a mouth. One fateful night, the comet slammed into the ogre homelands with such force that it was felt half the world away. All life around the impact site was obliterated in an instant. Two thirds of the ogre population was extinguished as if smote by an angry god. Only those near the edge of the plains escaped immediate destruction. The raging firestorms that followed the comet's fall incinerated everything for miles and distant witnesses said that it seemed as if the beasts of living flame hunted the lands. Should any have been close enough to peer into the massive crater, they would have seen that the comet had burrowed deep into the heart of the world. Not all ogres were destroyed. 
Those farthest from the impact survived, but for them the worst was yet to come. The once vital plains were reduced to a searing desert of howling sandstorms and toxic mists. The grasslands were gone, the beast herds were dead, and there was nothing in the wasteland to provide nourishment, so the remaining ogres soon fell to starvation. Cannibalism quickly set in, and an unnatural hunger gnawed away at the once full bellies of the ogres. Perhaps the whole disaster were engineered by the Dragon Emperor's coven of astromancers, or perhaps it was some ill turn of fate that crashed the comet directly into the heart of their homeland. But to the ogres, it seemed that a vengeful deity had fallen upon them, a great and terrible moor that existed purely to feed. Thus, the insatiable and merciless god of the ogres was born. The remaining ogres were reduced in number, but the survivors proved to be the strongest of their species, for the weak did not last long. With bellies aching from hunger, desperate tribes wandered the barrens seeking any kind of substance, while keeping wary eyes on the sporadic storms that scoured the empty plains. Those without the muscle or fortitude to make it soon eaten by their own tribes. Yet no matter how much the ogres gorged, they could never fully satisfy their eternal appetites. Mired in the barren wastes with no food and suffering endless hunger pangs, there was little choice for the survivors but to move elsewhere. A great cloud of poisonous vapours hung over the comet's wake, blocking all eastwards routes towards Cathay, so the ogres were forced to travel to the unexplored west. Ogre legend tells of Groth Onefinger, a prophet amongst his kind who, before departing the old lands, dared to lead his tribe on a journey across the deadly desert to look upon and offer sacrifice to this new and powerful god. It was no easy matter travelling to the collision site. Hunger, flesh-tearing cyclones and nameless monsters plagued Groth and his tribe. As they neared the impact zone, the fierce wind suddenly changed. Instead of swirling aimlessly, the wind now rushed inwards towards the crater's hole. So strong was that pull that the ogres had to fight for every step, lest the intake suck them into the great pit. When Groth and his tribe reached the edge, hunkering down and gripping the edge for dear life, what they saw was astounding, and it has since been depicted on countless gut plates and banners, and is forever etched into the consciousness of the ogre race. The gaping hole that stretched before Groth was immense, like some newly grown inland sea, except there was no water within, only empty, plummeting blackness. Its edge was filled with ridge upon ridge of jagged teeth and rippling, convulsing muscle that stretched down into the vast nothingness. Here was a gullet so bottomless it could swallow the ogre race into oblivion and still hunger for more. Groth and some few survivors returned with tales that filled the remaining ogres with awe. Thousands of years have passed, but many ogres still follow the footsteps of Groth, for the great moor exists there still. A vile, pulsing god visited upon the world by the vengeful heavens. Not all who take that journey return, for the trip is deadly. Where once vast herds grazed, now giant razor-limbed insects lurk, waiting to burst from under the wasted land to attack unwary prey. Large carrion birds ride high on the thermals above, keen eyes searching for their next meal. Most deadly of all, however, is the great moor itself, for it still hungers. The presence of the Great Moor writhes in the minds of all ogres, beckoning them to return, to stand upon the mighty precipice. So ogres have become a restless race, forever seeking to escape from that whisper in the back of their minds that pulls them back to their gluttonous yet insatiable god. Some ogres, those that have travelled around the globe, even claim that there is another moor in the ocean on the far side of the world, a vast fanged whirlpool that devours any ship that strays too close. Yet no distance is great enough to escape the pull and lure of the Great Moor. No ritual or feast can fully appease its eternal appetite, and, whilst it hungers still, its barbarous sons will feed and feed and feed until they consume the world. Those ogres who made it past the first few peaks on their grand migration made a fateful discovery. The upper mountain tops were permanently wreathed in mist, but one that cloud cover was breached it could be seen that those mighty mountains soared higher still, surely standing as the highest and steepest range in the world. There, far above the clouds, the ogres first observed the Sky Titans and their vast herds. The Sky Titans were an ancient race, much taller and far more intelligent than the giants of today. 
The Sky Titans had hewn vast fortresses into the mountains themselves. Blunt, megalithic citadels that overlooked shimmering seas of clouds, pierced by great islands of rock on which stood other castles. Hermitic by nature, the Sky Titans had long ago forgotten about other races of the world, for they were content in their reclusive realm. Hidden from others by the sheer inaccessible nature of the peaks and their shrouding cover of cloud, the Sky Titans rarely descended below the tree line, save only to tend their herds of cave beasts and enormous mammoths. It was these gargantuan beasts that the ogres first encountered, and the ravenous ogres at first thought that they had reached some golden realm of plenty and a veritable promised land of red meat. They were utterly unprepared for herds of animals as fierce and as dangerous as these. However, many ogres found that, instead of a gluttonous feast, they were instead gored by mighty tusks or stomped to death beneath thunderous hooves. The ogres swiftly learned that the only way to pull down such creatures was to work together, separating a single beast from the pack, much as they had observed the giant wolves hunting the snowy slopes. Noting the growing losses amongst their herds, the Sky Titans were soon made aware of this new ugly threat that had climbed the mountains to assail them. Although alarmed, the Sky Titans were far from helpless, and they unleashed lightning storms of avalanches slaying many ogres and driving others off the mountainside to fall to their doom. Thus began what the ogres call the War in the Heavens, pitting the last surviving ogre tribes against the Sky Titans. Always the attackers, the ogres surrounded and besieged each peak while the Sky Titans defended their castles with enormous cannons, their largest and most loyal herd beasts, and, finally, their vast bodies, stomping upon ogres or snatching them up and hurling them great distances so they plummeted through the clouds and fell many miles to their deaths. Although their population had been drastically reduced, the ogres still outnumbered the Sky Titans by hundreds to one, and, what's more, the ogres attacked together in tribes, whilst the Sky Titans lived alone in their, in their fortress-like peaks, too solitary to ever unite under a single banner. The war was a bitter one, but with every victory, the ogres grew stronger, as every battle provided an absolute glut of flesh. One by one, the isolated mountaintop keeps fell, and bloody feasts took place in their colossal halls. The more fortunate victims were already dead when the eating began, but by no means were all so lucky. As the ogres rampaged further into the mountain range, they noticed that not only did the mountains tower even taller, but the sky titans also grew larger and larger. The most ancient of that long-lived race grew to enormous sizes, yet over the great ages of their lives the sky titans became even more sedentary, until finally becoming like the mountains themselves. Many ogres believed that the final peaks that they climbed in the ancient giant lands were not mountains at all, but instead the eldest of the sky titans, now permanently erothed in living stone. If this was so, they were the last of their kind, for the ogres could find no more, and they reckoned that they had devoured the entire race down to the last finger bone. There was rumour of the final few sky titans unfettering their mountain tops and sailing away on the clouds, but if this were true, None could say to where the refugees fled, or even if they arrived there safely. Not content with destroying their foes utterly, the ogres slaughtered their herds of beasts and rampaged across the peaks, toppling castles into the valleys below. Today only a few shattered stone shells and a wide scattering of immense ruins on the valley floors give any evidence of the once proud race of gentle giants and the amazing heights they had reached with their architectural marvels. For a while, the ogres were content to stay put, sprawling out atop the shattered halls of the Sky Titans and dining on the dwindling and now shepherdless creatures. Yet there, on the very roof of the world, the ogres began feeling the ill effects of living at such heights. Great clouds of debris from the explosive coming of the Great Moor continued to be carried upon the wind from the east and it fell heavily on those highest peaks. At night the sky shimmered with an unnatural aurora and, instinctively, the ogres knew that they must press onwards. Some few foolhardy ones stayed, choosing to live high up above the clouds despite the premonitions many felt. Although ogres have been proven particularly stubborn to the mutating effects of chaos, they are by no means immune. Over the centuries, the ogres that stayed to eke out a living amongst the dust-tainted sky castles regressed in nature until they became feral and bestial. 
They evolved white shaggy fur and long talons and a new affinity for the harsh cold in which they lived. Thus was the mountaintop race of the Yetis born, and although rare, the abominable creatures have spread to many other high places of the world, where they prey on all who dare those frosty realms. As the majority of the ogre tribes descended the colossal mountains of the ancient giant lands, they headed further westwards, into the range known as the Mountains of Morn. There the ogres found the air more wholesome, for the unnatural storms and their mutating effects spent their fury on the taller slopes that they had left behind. The peaks and valleys of the Mountains of Morn were rich hunting grounds, harbouring a dizzying profusion of creatures. The ogre tribes settled in, establishing lairs and campsites amidst the craggy valley floors. Although there were many battles to drive out monstrous creatures, and full-scale wars with the tribes of Greenskin, Skaven clans, and even a few far-flung dwarf mines that needs to be broken down into and given a good scouring, before long the ogres came to dominate the land so fully that their area became known as the Ogre Kingdoms.